Welcome back to the Illumination Talks. And today we're going to discuss the, the Stratford man, William Shakespeare. And the question today is, who was William Shakespeare? Uh, well, that might sound like an odd question because we know exactly who William Shakespeare was. He was the Stratford man from Stratford-on-Avon. And we know this because thousands of people, no, tens of thousands of people go to Stratford-on-Avon every year to see the home city of William Shakespeare. So we know exactly who he is. Or do we? This is a continuation of, of the same theme of these talks, that we cannot always trust the orthodox history. History is not all that it seems. Sometimes we are taught things that are not entirely the gospel truth. And there are many reasons to doubt the official identification of William Shakespeare. And these include fairly obvious things, I suppose, like the Stratford man um, had the wrong name. As you can see, some of the early folios, in fact, many of the early folios, were written by Shakespeare's, a hyphenated name. In fact, it's not really even a name. It's not William Shakespeare. It's just a title, Shakespeare's. And that's a little bit odd, really. So the Stratford man doesn't entirely have the same name as the... Uh, prolific author. And there again, the Stratford man could barely write his own signature. I mean, these are the um, signatures, six of the signatures of William Shakespeare. And these are known signatures of Shakespeare taken from various documents that he signed. Um, are these the signatures of a learned man, of a prolific author? of the father of English literature? Just look at them. Yes, okay. Well, in the same vein, the daughters of the Stratford man were illiterate. Judith could not even sign her name, and she signed with a mark. And Susanna, when she signed, she signed with a squiggle. Could it really be that the daughters of the father of English literature were illiterate? Would they be brought up in an illiterate household? It does seem strange, doesn't it? And the last will and testament of the Stratford man is equally strange because the Stratford man left no library in his will. No books, no manuscripts, no sonnets, no plays. Uh, not even any unfinished plays and sonnets for posterity. Could it really be that the father of English literature didn't have a library, didn't have any books to leave to his descendants? It does sound strange, doesn't it? But there again, you know, the Stratford man had no higher education. He was not some scholar of Oxford University. He was merely a student of Stratford Grammar. He had never attended royal court. He had never had a legal e education. Um, he had no degree in history. He had never been to Italy. And yet all of these elements are central to Shakespearean literature. And the Stratford man had no connection to the Earl of Southampton, who was his primary benefactor. And he didn't lament the death of Elizabeth I, who died in 1603. And she again was supposed to be one of his benefactors. And then we come on to the monument of the Stratford man, who's in the, um, it's in the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford. And it is, as you might expect, the bust of an author with pen and manuscript, apparently going to write his, his last sonnet before his death. It's just what you might expect from a, a great author and a great playwright. However, 
There is a lithograph of this monument from the 1640s, and originally it depicted a wool sack, not a pen and a parchment. Why? Well, because the Stratford man was a wool trader, not an author. And this demonstrates the true profession of the Stratford man. He was a wool trader, not a playwright and a poet. So, as we've seen many times before in this research, things are not always quite as we've been told. So who was the real Shakespeare? Well, some have speculated that he was uh, Sir Francis Bacon. Um, well, others have speculated that he was Elizabeth I herself. But I think the best answer comes from uh, Thomas Looney in the 1920s. And he said that Shakespeare was really Edward de Vere, the seventh Earl of Oxford. And this is the seventh Earl. So why should we consider Edward de Vere as being the true Shakespeare? Well, because a lot of his life, a great deal of his life, fits in very well with what we know about William Shakespeare. For instance, Edward de Vere was given a first-class education in law and the classics by the best private tutors in the land. He was a favourite of Elizabeth I, who we sort of know was a patron of Shakespeare. And de Vere spent two years in Italy, which may well be why uh, nearly a third of the plays of Shakespeare are set in Italy. The Merchant of Venice, Romeo and Juliet, Taming of the Shrew, Much Ado About Nothing, they were all based in Italy by someone who knew Italy very well. But the Stratford man knew little or nothing about Italy. He hadn't been out of the country as far as we know. So why would he set ten of his plays in a country he had never visited? It's doubtful that he would, but Edward de Vere, of course, had lived in Italy. He knew the location well, and therefore ten of his plays were set in Italy. Uh, similarly, many of these Shakespearean plays and sonnets were based on courtly life, which the Stratford man would have known very little about, but Edward de Vere knew intimately because he lived in the royal court of Elizabeth I, and he was praised as being the finest poet in the court of Elizabeth I. And then we come to the patrons of Shakespeare. And one of the primary patrons was Henry Reasley, who was the Earl of Southampton. And here he is, dressed in his armour, looking very fine. And two of the poems uh, of Shakespeare were dedicated to the Earl of Southampton. And the Earl of Southampton was identified as being the fair youth in Shakespearean sonnets. Now, the Stratford man had no connection that we know of with the Earl of Southampton, but Edward de Vere did, because they had the same guardian, William Cecil. Uh, in fact, de Vere married Cecil's daughter later on, and so you might say that de Vere eventually became the um, guardian-in-law to the Earl of Southampton. They were intimately connected with each other, so it's not surprising that we should find uh, that some of the Shakespearean plays were dedicated to the Earl of Southampton. Uh, furthermore, Shakespearean plays were not only de dedicated to the Earl of Southampton, they were also dedicated to the Earl uh, of Montgomery and the Earl of Pembroke. Um, but perhaps this is not so surprising because Edward de Vere's three daughters 
were betrothed to all three of these earls. Now again, the Stratford man had no connection to these important people, but Edward de Vere had very connect, close connections to all three because his daughters were betrothed to all three of these earls. We see the very, very close connections here we have between Edward de Vere and the life as we know it of Shakespeare, the author of the plays. Another strange thing is that, according to um, John Ward, who was the uh, vicar of the church in, in Stratford, uh, Shakespeare received a thousand pounds per annum uh, for the production of two plays each year. Now, this is a, an absurdly extravagant amount of money to give to an author. It would have made uh, Shakespeare a multimillionaire in modern terms. It would made, have made him the, the equivalent of an earl of the realm. It's, it's utterly impossible that um, the Stratford man received such a huge sum of money from the royal court. However, Edward de Vere did receive a thousand pounds per annum from the royal court. Now, we don't know exactly why Elizabeth I gave Edward de Vere a thousand pounds per annum. Uh, but it was speculated in the film Anonymous, which we'll look at in a minute, that he received this because he was her illegitimate son. Now, while that's possible, there's not much evidence to say that he was, but certainly he did receive a very large stipend from the court of Elizabeth I. And then there's the characters in the plays of Shakespeare, because Many of these characters appear to have been taken from the life of Edward de Vere, not, of course, from the life of the Stratford man. Uh, take um, Polonius, for instance, in Hamlet. Now, it's widely identified that Polonius was William Cecil, because both of these characters were the chief counsellor to the king. Cecil was, of course, the uh, chief counsellor of Elizabeth I. Now, Shakespeare deliberately portrays Polonius, that is, Cecil, uh, as being a foolish knave, wrong in all his judgment. Probably because William Cecil was de Vere's guardian and his father-in-law, who he apparently despised. So, Polonius is, is a cruel portrayal of Edward de Vere's father-in-law, uh, and therefore Hamlet is Edward de Vere himself. And it is Hamlet who stabs Polonius to death. So, as we can see, um, Edward de Vere could not attack Cecil with a sword, but he could certainly attack him with a pen. And so you see that these plays are intimately related to the life and times of Edward de Vere, not to the Stratford man uh, in rural Stratford to the north of London. So was Shakespeare really Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford? Well, surely if he was, then his present family would know all about it. His history should be well known to this important uh, family in Britain. Well, unfortunately, Edward de Vere was an extravagant earl who frittered away his inheritance and his titles. And so his entire family withered on the vine. It no longer exists. And so the legacy of Edward de Vere could have easily have been appropriated in later times, following his death in 1604, and attributed to someone else entirely. So this is an interesting story, and I think it's much more believable than the, the story we've been given about the Stratford man, the man who owned no library, no books, no manuscripts, could not write his own signature, and had illiterate children. 
And this was portrayed quite well in the film Anonymous, which came out recently, which speculates that many of the plays by Shakespeare were political, and they were designed by Edward de Vere uh, to sway public opinion against Robert Cecil, his father-in-law. And so they have this image of Edward de Vere scribbling away in his library, not just for the future of English history, but the future of the Tudor dynasty to which Edward de Vere was a, was a part. So the, the film goes on to speculate that the, um, the Essex rebellion against, well, supposedly against Elizabeth I in 1601 was part organized by Edward de Vere because in essence, this revolt was not against uh, Elizabeth I, it was against, uh, it was against the Cecils, possibly to prevent James I acceding to the throne. The throne therefore going to instead to the Earl of Essex or the Earl of Southampton, and thus saving the Tudor dynasty to which they were related. So Shakespeare, uh, Edward de Vere, that is, uh, commissioned an emergency production of Richard II or Richard III at the Globe Theatre, which portrays Cecil as a deformed hunchback in order to sway public opinion in their favour. But the, the uprising failed, of course, and they were all captured, and uh, one or two of them were actually uh, tried and beheaded. And while this is all speculation, it's entirely plausible and comes directly from the facts from real history. And it appears to be much more likely than the story of the, uh, the illiterate man from Stratford. And what does all this have to do with my research into biblical history? How did I get onto this subject in the first place? Well, this all came about because of a study of Greek coins, strangely enough. Um, so it stemmed from the observation that Shakespeare's name was originally hyphenated, as we saw before. He had the name or title Shakespeare. And yet we know who Shakespeare was. She was the Greek goddess Athena, the spear shaker. But the question then becomes, why would Edward de Vere choose a pseudonym like Athena? Well, uh, well, let's look at Athena then. Here is Athena, the goddess of wisdom and warfare, the guardian of Athens. And she is always portrayed, as you can see, with a helmet and quite often with her shield and her spear, because she was the spear shaker. And her colossal statue once stood in the Parthenon on the Acropolis in Athens. But if you want to see it now, you will have to go to uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And um, this is the Parthenon in Nashville. And it stood there for quite some time, actually, think since the 1920s, I think. But recently, they've put in inside here a full-scale, exact replica of Athena, just as she would have looked in the Greek Parthenon. And here she is, complete with shield and spear, and holding a Nike, the symbol of victory. It's magnificent, really, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to do something, if you're going to make something, do it large and do it well. And this is exactly what they've done. They've made this colossal statue of Athena in the Nashville Parthenon. Anyway, this is Athena, the spear shaker. But she's not always portrayed standing like this. Quite often, on coinage especially, she was portrayed seated. So here she is, this is Athena again. She is seated, complete with her helmet, as she always has, and her spear, and her shield. 
and again she's holding the um, Nike, the symbol of uh, victory. And from Greece, she migrated, as many things did, into Roman coinage. Um, so here she is on a Roman coin, and again she is seated in exactly the same fashion with her spear and shield and Nike. And here she's often identified as being the Roman Roma, a symbol of Rome. But essentially she is uh, Athena, just as she was in Greece. And from Rome, of course, she ended up on the coinage of Britain. And here she's portrayed in exactly the same fashion, but she became known as the British Britannia. And this is a coin from the second century AD, so this history goes back an awful long way. And it lasted an awful long time as well. It lasted through all of the um, Tudor era, of course. And here is Britannia again on a coin from 1967, this one, of Athena. But of course here she is being portrayed as the British Britannia. But here she is with her helmet, her shield, and her spear, although her spear has turned into a trident because Britain ruled the waves, of course. And this is Athena as Britannia, a symbol of Great Britain. Not just a symbol, I suppose, of Great Britain, but probably the guardian of Great Britain because Athena was the goddess of war, guarding Great Britain. So here is Shakespeare, Athena, the guardian of the nation. So we can now see why Edward de Vere chose the pseudonym uh, Shakespeare for his works, because he was not only becoming the guardian of English history, the history of the nation, he was possibly becoming the guardian of the Tudor dynasty too. And so this is the real Shakespeare, Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. So I hope you've enjoyed this quick exploration of uh, Tudor England, and I hope you can join us again next time on these Illumination Talks.